In this video, I want to talk about what is the Lord referring to when he is talking about the people of Judah. So we're going to start by reading in Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to, the, came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during reigns, the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married, married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break, break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her lo Ruhama, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and it will come and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So who are the people of Judah and the people of Israel? These two groups that are going to come together and will appoint one leader and come up out of the land. Judah was also one of the sons of Leah, who was not the first choice, not the first choice of Jacob, but Leah was his wife nonetheless, and she bore him many sons, and one of her sons was Judah. And when Jacob was dying, he gave a blessing to each of his sons, Jacob, now called Israel, and the blessing that he gave to his son Judah was in Genesis 49, verse 8, Judah, your sons will, excuse me, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he, to him it belongs, shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. So God has separated in Hosea, he has separated the people of Judah and the people of Israel who are going to come together in the end. Judah is like a lion. His hand is on the neck of his enemies. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And you've heard it said that Christians are of the tribe of Judah because Jesus was descended from Judah, from that particular tribe. That's what Judah is. When the word is referring to Judah in a symbolic way, that's what Judah is. It's referring to Gentile Christians because Christians are engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel. They are adopted into sonship through Jesus Christ. So they come in through Jesus Christ, adopted into his tribe. So these are those who are going to come together with Israel in the very end, as is spoken of in Hosea 1. And you see this theme again in Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 16. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is to Ephraim, and the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will come become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one in my hand in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, 
and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. The nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. Isaiah 11, verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish, and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile toward Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. They will subdue Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites will be subject to them. Okay, so I'm not sure why it is that God put this on my heart, but what I am noticing right now is a highlighting, and I've I've been the, you know, on the on the other end of this is this jealousy of Ephraim toward Judah. And Paul talked about it. He talked about his hope that he would arouse the envy and jealousy of his own people that they might be saved. Let's read it. Let's go to Romans 11, verse 11. Again, I asked, did they stumble so far as to, uh, so f- far as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So do you see the connection here? Or I should say connections that God is making in order to help us to understand who Judah is, who Israel is, and how he's kind of divided them, but will bring them together. And one of the things that Paul talks about is that we were once handed over to wickedness so that we might understand salvation, so that we might understand the sovereign choice and mercy of God. And that Jews or the Israelites had been handed over, they had have now been handed over to disobedience so that they will come to understand because they had become proud. And it's very interesting to me because one of the things that was read today in Sabbath was Deuteronomy 8. Let's go ahead and read it. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock and gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You might say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms your co- his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. 
If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. So God had already already warned his people that this was going to happen if they didn't remember him. If they did not hold their hearts accountable for remembering him and revering him and loving him and remembering that he's the one who gave all of this to them. Now, I said I've been on the receiving end of this this week because, you know, I've had some people come against things that I'm saying or I've heard people say that Christians tried that Christians changed the law of the Jews. That's not true. Christians did not change the law of the Jews. That was the accusation that came against Paul. That's what he was constantly being accused of. And and by the way, you should know he's still being accused of that by Jews. Paul was a Jew himself. He was a Pharisee. He taught the law. He believed in the law. And in fact, he was well regarded by the Pharisees and persecuted Christians. So, I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing, the way that God raises these servants, right? Like, I mean, I was a, a servant for the field of mental health. There was a lot that I did. I was well regarded in my field. And I always knew that there was a reason why he allowed me to get that degree in spite of everything that, I mean, I didn't come from wealth. I, you know, was a, a young single mom. I always knew that there was a reason why God allowed me to get that degree. And I really pursued that. And and that actually led, drove a lot of what I did, even in, you know, getting to the point where I, where my career was stable so that I could really devote myself to doing whatever it was that he wanted. And uh, the more that I tried to do that by the work of my hands, man, the further away I got. Uh, but he did, he, he put that in my heart. And my desire after having been in 12 steps for so many years, did various 12 step, you know, programs, my goodness, they've got one for everything. My desire was to, uh, you know, to be able to help people to heal spiritually because I saw in 12 steps that that was the biggest thing that was holding people back. They simply could not develop a relationship with what they were calling in 12 steps, a higher power. It was such a sticking point for them because of all of, because of so many wounds that were prohibiting them from being able to really connect to God and submit to him and trust him. So my intention had all, had always been for many years to write a book and to pursue this, but God took me down a totally different road, right? Like he, he knew that desire in my heart, not because he saw it, like he discovered it, but because he placed it there. I wrote that book. I just did not know how that was going to come about. Every time I had sat down to write the book previously, I was just like completely lost. How do you even do this? He had to build it in me. He had to lead me to a son and then build it in me. Anyway, I don't want to get too off topic. The point is that Paul is still being accused of being, of having changed the laws of the Jews. Christians are being accused of that. I'm being accused even within counterfeit Christianity of, you know, being extra biblical, of talking about things that people are unfamiliar with because they're unfamiliar with the word. When they're saying I'm being extra biblical, I know exactly why they're saying that because they have not followed what the word has said, which is don't just read the word, but you need to apply it. And because they don't understand what it is I say, I know that it's because they're not applying the word because they would understand if they did those things. James not only said that, but Jesus said it. If you do the things I say, you're going to know that I'm from God. That's what Jesus said in the book of John. And so is it Christian's fault that, uh, you know, that Jews think that, that they've changed the law? No, it's their fault. It's their fault because they didn't have a heart for God. And the people who are saying that right now, they don't have a heart for God. If they do, if they change and they turn and they have a heart for God, then they're going to know what the truth is. And the same goes for Christians. It is not just for Jews. Just because you say that you believe in Christ doesn't mean you do. You got to do the things he said. But the issue here that in in the the book of Hosea, which is where we started, is that there is a divide between Jews and Christians. There is a separation between us right now, and that separation is going to be bridged. And I believe the reason why God is bringing this to me is because he's doing it 
right now. He is separating right now between this fourth and fifth trumpet, the next two years that we have before the Antichrist rises. He is separating those who actually have a heart for him, for, for him from those who do not. And he's going to reveal. He's going to reveal to those who have a heart for him, who have not accepted him yet. He will reveal himself to them. These people will have already returned to God by the time the fifth trumpet blows. To be very honest, I don't want to say any more than that because I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I don't know if this is something that's going to happen over time. I'm not sure what it looks like, so I'm just going to leave it there. But I know he's beginning to give me understanding about about the next thing. He's beginning to build this. So I just wanted to make sure that you understand what the word is talking about when it talks about Judah, when it's talking about this separation, when it's talking about bringing these two sticks together and making them one in his hand. But I will say this, he says he's going to take the Jews out of the nations where he's where he scattered them. Here we go. Let's go back to Ezekiel 37. When your people ask, why won't you tell us what you mean by this? So he takes the two sticks, Brute makes them one in his hand. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. This is happening right now. So we can understand what this means, like where the time is. If, if you are in the assembly and you've been brought out of the nations and you're coming to the assembly and you're saying things like, I feel like I'm home, I'm with my people, we know what this is. We know what God means. He does not have to bring everybody to the literal physical land of Jerusalem. He's brought us together. We are the land. He's pulled us out of the nations and he's pulled us out of Babylon and out of the nations, by the way, means that we were never supposed to become a part of these other nations. We were never supposed to become a part of the world. We were supposed to be set apart. And so what he's doing is he's setting us apart in the assembly. He has consecrated us and brought us into that land of Jerusalem. It does not mean that you go to the land that you go live in the land of Israel. That's not what it means. We are Israel. We are Jerusalem. So it says, hold before their eyes, the sticks you have written on and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from around from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over them and they will never again be two nations or be two, be divided into two kingdoms. Okay, so so listen, like don't rely on your own understanding because if, if, if I had read this and I didn't understand what he was doing right now and what he's revealed to me and what he's revealed to, to the assembly, I might say, well, this is going to happen like after the resurrection. No, it's happening right now, right now. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or any of their offenses, for I will save them from their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. Well, he just told us actually in Ezekiel 36 what that looks like, that the time is coming when he's going to make a new covenant with us, and he's going to take out our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, and he's going to place his spirit in us and begin to move us to follow his laws and keep his decrees. You know, evil people want to say that, oh, well, that happens later. That happens at the resurrection. And you know why? Because they don't want to take any responsibility for being moved right now in their covenant. But I'm here to tell you if, you, if that's not happening to you, if you are not disgusted by the things that you used to do when you go back to them, and, uh, you know, someone was sharing today about how they were, like, telling a joke and they had to swear in order for the joke to work, right? So they had to say a cuss word, and it bothered them, and it bothered them so much Uh you know, that it, it, it just it did not fit with them anymore. It didn't fit with who they are. If that's not happening to you, you're not in your covenant. And if you're not in your covenant, like now is the time for the covenant, guys. You don't like receive the reward and then you're in the covenant. No, now is the time to live in that covenant. You have to be fulfilling that covenant or you don't receive the reward. So he says, my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd. 
They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. So it's not something God does for you. It's something he moves you into. And part of the way he moves you into it is through godly grief. Like if you're connected with him, you should be feeling godly grief. If you're feeling condemnation, that is because of you. It's not because of me. It's not because anybody else, it's anybody else's fault that you feel condemnation. Frankly and honestly, if you feel condemnation, it is because you are condemned. That is because you have not returned to the Lord. So you need to return. It's nobody else's fault. You can't blame anyone else for that. So he's already moving us to follow his laws and keep his decrees. And it says, they will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where their ancestors lived. They and their children, their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. His sanctuary, by the way, is his presence. His presence is what makes a temple a temple. I hope that's made some of this language and these concepts clear uh, so that you can understand a little bit better your covenant and, and also what God is fulfilling in these end times. Please discern with him.